Val Hendash, so she'll come up here and speak to us about the legislative process and how things work. And uh, let's see, she is the executive director of the Georgia House Democratic Caucus. So let's give a hand for Val. So uh, as Kayla said, I, my name is Val Hendash. Um, I am currently serving as the executive director of the Georgia House Democratic Caucus. Um, before this role, well, I've been in this role for about two years now. Before this role, I served as the executive assistant to the minority leader, who was Stacey Abrams at the time, for 60 years. Um, and then before that, I worked for Senator, now Senator Elena Parent, and then Representative Kathy Ash. Um, so I have been down at the Georgia General Assembly since 2011. Um, so here, Kayla asked me to come talk to you all today about the legislative process. And so, you know, if y'all have any questions, please let me know. Um, so, you know, to start things first, like I work for the House Democratic Caucus, which means that I help the 75 Democratic representatives uh, legislate, you know, help them win their elections, while at the same time uh, help on the electoral side of things, which means our goal at the end of the day is to get to 91 members. Um, and then this whole conversation is pretty much just going to iterate why getting to 91 is so important. Um, so right now, the, the Georgia House of Representatives, we have 180 members total. Um, 75 of them are Democrats, uh, 105 of them are Republicans. Um, so we have a Republican speaker, David Ralston, who's not from too far from here. Um, and so, you know, the legislature, the House of Representatives, what we deal with, I mean, we deal with everything from taxation, we deal with the host scholarship, we deal with, um, education, we deal with everything that you can think of. Um, so the chamber right now, it's an interesting time to be in the chamber. When I first started, we had 62 Democrats. Uh, we grew our numbers by 13 over the last electoral cycle. Uh, it has made, yeah, that's a, yeah, it's a, it's a big feat. Um, and, you know, I think the national politics kind of helped. People were fed up. We were starting to field candidates in areas where we hadn't fielded candidates in a long time. So it, it makes a difference in the legislative process. So, you know, the legislative process, how a bill kind of becomes a law, and this is like a very oversimplified overview. Um, you know, a representative will get an idea or have a constituent come to them and say, hey, we should do, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, that representative will take that idea, go to the legislative council, which is just a team of attorneys in the Georgia General Assembly, draft a bill, take it to, you know, file it with the speaker's office. The speaker's office will say, okay, and this is all to show you all how powerful the speaker of the house is. Um, the speaker will say, okay, this bill gets assigned, so say it's a bill about education. It gets assigned to the education committee. And so it goes through the committee process where you'll have like a kind of a subsection of the 180 members. So you'll have about probably like 20 to 30 members on that education committee um, who are Democrat and Republican. Um, that will go through the bill and vet, you know, see if the idea is good, go through the bill, see if you can make amendments, recommendations on how to make it better. Um, you know, the speaker assigns those committees, he assigns the chairman to those committees, and so, you know, they kind of like a working group. Um, so that group kind of works together, make sure that the bill is, you know, as good as can be. They'll pass out of the, that committee, it'll go to the rules committee after that. So the rules committee is pretty much you have to pass the rules committee for y'all to get to the a vote on the house floor. So, you know, the rules committee is a, another subsection of a you know Democrats and Republicans um, who will get together and kind of go through. Okay, is this bill good for passage? Is it not? Does it need to get sent back? Um, once it passes the rules committee, it is eligible to be called onto the house floor for a vote. And so basically, the speaker will stand up there, call the bill up, and most bills need a like a requisite majority of 91 members, which is just the majority, a simple majority of the chamber. Um, if that bill passes with 91 votes, um, it'll go to the Senate and pretty much repeat the exact same, um, the exact same uh, process. Um, so I mean, it sounds very basic, and it sounds I'm totally oversimplifying it. Um, the Georgia General Assembly is a part-time legislature, which means that they are not in session all year round. So imagine all the bills that y'all hear about, you know, we pass hundreds uh, of bills on, you know, on a yearly basis. They have 40 legislative days, which amounts to probably three, three and a half months of work. 
So imagine all those bills being condensed into that one time frame period. So it gets a little chaotic and it's very hectic. Um, so what happens, the way that it's laid out, you know, the first few weeks, you're talking about the budget, which is the one piece of legislation that we are uh, constitutionally mandated to pass in the state of Georgia. Um, you know, it starts off kind of quiet and then it gets kind of busier and busier as we reach day 30. So day 30 is called crossover day. So basically, any bill that needs to cross over to the other chamber must cross over on that day. Um, then, like, day 31 through 40, it's basically the House side will be vetting Senate bills, and then the Senate will be vetting House bills. Um, so, you know, it kind of gets more and more chaotic as it gets to day 40. Day 40 is the last day that people can pass a bill. Um, if you do not pass a bill by day 40, either it's still in the committee process, so say like this year, if you had a bill and didn't pass on cross on sunny die, which is the last day, day 40, um, you can come back next year and kind of pick off, pick up where you left off. Um, if it does not pass by the second year, which is like their term, you have to start the process all over again. Um, so the process is, you know, um, it's interesting, it's a lot of back and forth, it's a lot of conversations, committee meetings, hearings. Um, you know, a lot of people, I think, uh, you know, I always tell folks it's a lot easier to access your Georgia General Assembly than folks might think. Um, you know, I know I worked in an office where if somebody emails us or calls us, we try to get back to them as soon as possible. Uh, it's easy to come and talk to your representative. So some folks, you know, a lot of folks, you know, think about D.C., think about, you know, the National, Congressional, U.S. Senate. Um, you know, the State House is really what deals with what affects you, your neighbors, um, your classmates, your students' class, or your kids' classmates, um, and really the community that we can see and feel. Um, so, you know, these representatives are in the community. They're out there, they're talking to folks, they're talking to groups. Um, so, I mean, it's as easy as picking up, you know, if there's a bill that you don't like, or you do like even, it's as easy as picking up the phone, calling their office and saying, hey, like, I'm a constituent, um, we'd love, you know, your support on this, we'd love for you to oppose it. Um, at the end of the day, they might vote not in the way that you want them to, um, but a lot of the times, you know, if you go down to the state capitol, you can probably have a conversation with that person. Um, so I'm like a very big fan of like a very huge advocate for having folks come down and advocate for whatever issue you need to come talk to them about. Um, so, you know, it's a lot more accessible than folks think. Um, you know, these are people who are your neighbors, your family members. Um, they're not far removed. It's not like they're in D.C. where they have to, you know, live there, you know, take a jet to fly there. Or, um, these are folks who come back to the community and kind of are entrenched in it. Um, so that's kind of like a very basic overview um, of uh, how the process kind of works. And I mean, I'll open it up to questions to help kind of flow with the discussion. So if anybody has questions or anybody wants to know anything in particular, I'm certainly happy to, to talk about or discuss it. Yes, sir? What's the breakup of the Senate? <laughs> the Senate, they have 56 members over there. Uh, I believe they have 21 Democrats and the rest of them Republicans. Um, so they do have a Republican. The lieutenant governor is a Republican. He's the one who's like kind of the speaker in the Senate. Um, so they're still in the minority. Um, we are a little bit closer in the House, um, which, I mean, makes a big difference. Uh, the Senate has a little bit of ways to go. So if you're wanting to speak to your representative per se, what is the first step in, in doing? You said going up there and speaking to them, of course, about the issue, but how, what is the best way you know that they're there or, I mean, are there office hours, all that online as well to be able to do that? So or? it depends. So the number one step I would do is look up who your state representative and state senator are. Because um, sometimes if you go to the wrong office, they'll kind of just like shuffle you around until you get to the right place. Um, and you know, you know, you can go to openstates.org, you type in you know your address, and they'll show you who your state representative and state senator are. Um, during session, it's a little easier um, to pick up the phone and say, you know, I'm a constituent. This is how I feel. I mean, you can do phone call, email, or if you're like in town or want to personally come visit. 
Um, you can do that too. Yeah. And, um, I know. Can, you, can you give us our representative's address so we can just knock on the door? <laughs> no. Uh, no, I wish I meant I meant their office, not on the door. But what you can do during session, what you can do during session is if they're in the session, like in session that day, um, there's little forms that are outside in the hallway that say, you know, name, date, you know, why do you want to speak to a representative? Who is it to? You give it to what we call the pages, which are like like children who are between the ages of 12 to 18. They take the note into the chamber and they send it to the representative. And so that way they can kind of come out of the chamber and come have a conversation with you. That's something that I really, really think that people like should know about uh, because a lot of time, I mean, some folks like will not come talk to you. But a lot of them do tend to come out and say, hey, have a conversation. So that way you can have that face-to-face -face and say, hey, listen, like, what are your thoughts on this bill? This is why I'm opposing it. You know, can you reconsider or not reconsider? Um, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting to watch during session. So, like, in, outside of the chamber halls, there's kind of, like, a small area where, you know, advocates, lobbyists, uh, citizens, constituents can come, take that sheet of paper, stand in line, and wait as the representative kind of gets called out, not called out, but called out of the chamber. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, I would definitely, depending on the issue, uh, I mean, sometimes an email is sufficient. Um, you know, sometimes if it's like a very dangerous bill that's going through, and sometimes it's helpful to hear from folks in person, mm -hmm. um, that's something that I really advocate because it's a lot easier to have that conversation with somebody in person versus you're just a form email that gets sent to their inbox where their administrative assistant is just kind of counting up. Um, you know, how many emails they so, so get. And you're basically not going to speak to them on the phone, though, if you call. That's not going to happen. It depends. Some folks, if you've set up, like, a time um, and say, hey, listen, I really want to talk to them personally, um, a lot of times what will happen is the staff will take that first phone call and kind of take down the issue and then pass it along to the member. Mm -hmm. um, and it depends on the issue because we've gotten some issues where, I mean, we've gotten phone call after phone call after phone call, and, you know, during session, especially when it gets busier and busier, um, it gets tougher and tougher because the members are still trying to go to their committee meetings, go to the House floor, make sure, because if they're not in committees, um, then their voices aren't heard in that process. Um, and that's, you know, something that they're going to have to try to manage as it gets busier and busier. So, and then outside of session, I would definitely say phone call. It's probably easier outside of session to contact those folks and say, hey, I'd love to set up 15, 20 minutes to talk to you about this one issue. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a little bit easier outside of session. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, I always like to tell folks, um, it's not what you see on, like, TV. Um, it's not where you think it's DC, where it's, you know, just uh, stonewalling and nobody's, like, talking to each other and, like, one side is just adamant versus there are very, very few times um, in my, in the years that I've been there that I've seen an actual, like, headbutting on partisan lines. Um, and honestly, probably the most contentious issue was a tax issue. Um, outside of the, you know, the social issues, I mean, we had a few contentious ones in this past session. Um, but, you know, a lot of the bills, I mean, out of the 700, I would probably say safely 90 to 95% of them get unanimous consent, which means everybody just votes yes. Um, and then the last 10 to 5% are typically the ones where either party line is butting heads or, you know, they're fighting amongst each other. Um, so, I mean, it's, uh, you know, as we get closer and closer in terms of numbers, in terms of balancing out the chamber, uh, that's going to become more important because it's going to be where people are going to have to have a meeting of the minds in terms of legislation. It's not going to be one person can just you know, introduce this absurd piece of legislation and then expect it to go through when they can't get the votes. Um, so, I mean, it's, ch it's changing. Georgia is, is changing. Uh, it's going to take, uh, it's going to make an impact legislatively. Um, so, I mean, it's going to be a very, this upcoming year especially is going to be incredibly interesting to watch. And then, of course, we have once, this year is incredibly crucial for us as well because once we get 2020, 2021 is redistricting. So controlling who draws the maps is going to be key. Um, the House is really the best, and I mean, I'm completely biased and correct in saying this. Um, the House is really the best seat that we have um, to have a seat at the table in terms of redistricting. 
because um, I mean that's going to determine what the representation is going to look like for the next decade. Um, so that means you know policies that a lot of Georgians need, you know, get voted on or don't get voted on. This isn't probably a crucial point. Or yes, sir. Uh, kind of two part question mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> is about what you know how what's the best way to know what is on the radar? It's like a hectic thirty days and stuff. And I know there's, you know, dot gov sites you can go yeah. and if you gotta really wade through it. But what I used to find really helpful, and I'm wondering if these guys, the Sierra Club had two paid lobbyists, mm -hmm. Neil Herring, and I forget the other guy, but he was a total oop. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe, I think so. And and I wonder, are those guys uh, still doing their thing? I kinda lost touch. Because they used to put out a newsletter like every couple of weeks during the lettuce you play was uh, assist, mm -hmm. uh, and you would read that thing, and it was a, a really, really good distillation, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it kind of had this humorous angle because it was like this guy describing the the Dukes of Hazard and all the <laughs> shenanigans that are up to and stuff. You would read it, and you'd be in tears by the end of it, yeah. either crying or laughing or both. You know? And so I just wondered if if, if you and, and as the party kind of had an eye on to those guys because they had very good radars and very good you know assessment of all the you know intricate stuff going yeah. on with the legislative process. Um, yeah, I mean that's a good way to, to know what's going on is like looking into and tapping into the resources that advocacy groups like Sierra Club um, have, and you know they'll put out like a newsletter and um, kind of inform folks. Um, the government website, I mean, you you really have to be looking for something um, to find anything. It's pretty wonky to wait through. Right. right. Um, honestly, like for me, I really like the AJC's Daily Jolt. Um, that is something that kind of condenses, um, and I know that there's also a Georgia 10 by 10, and that kind of condenses, like, what's going on. And, like, once the session starts, everybody is pretty much, like, legislative-centered. Um, another thing, and this is, like, you know, kind of funny, but uh, Twitter is a huge tool for <coughs> Mm -hmm. um, so like if you go like to the tag, like hashtag GA poll, um, and you can literally watch in real time things happening. So like people, either staffers, either you know representatives themselves, um, the official record. Also they have like the official house has a account on there. Um, so watching that feed helps being like oh we need you know somebody here or we need to talk about more about this issue. We need to do this that and more. Um, another good thing too, and I mean this is like something that like, you really would have to be looking for, is on the website you can stream the proceedings. Um, so you can have a live stream up on the house floor about what's happening, and it gets like interesting like probably in February, because um, that's when they actually start like passing out bills and talking about legislation. Um, and then you can watch committee meetings too on that website. And so if you go to legis.ga.gov, there's a tab that says, you know, House of Representatives, and then you can go stream, you know, whatever committee meeting. So if there's like a contentious bill, uh, let's say, in, you know, judiciary and on civil, uh, you can stream that meeting and watch as they kind of go back and forth and watch the debate and then watch the eventual vote. Um, so that's, those, there's kind of like multiple ways, uh, but that's a really good one is like going to the advocacy groups to say they can kind of um, narrow down because like we just deal with so many issues. And so they can kind of narrow down and say, okay, this, these are top five issues that Sierra Club is dealing with, environmental justice is dealing with, um, and then this is what we need to watch. Um, so, I mean, but for me, it's it's Twitter. Twitter is the one that's like, oh, keep everything up to date because everybody's talking all the time. Yeah, yeah. I just realized that. <laughs> like, just realized that Twitter is a good, mm -hmm. you know, tool to, to use. By, yeah. By following your, your representative, who would you follow? So, so... One, the party, um, the House Caucus account, obviously, um, you know, we try to put out as much as we can in terms of social media. Um, you know, the state representatives, like, there's a good bit of them that have Twitter accounts. Um, so, I mean, obviously, like, the leader, who's Bob Trammell on the House. Um, you know, you have folks like uh, David Dreyer, Scott Holcomb, B. Wynn, Renita Shannon. Um, you have to, just a diversity of folks, members in the caucus that sit there and either tweet something out or, you know, try to inform the public about, hey, we just took this vote. Um, the Republicans do, a, a, a subsection of them do a good job of saying, I voted no on this bill, and then they link to their vote. I voted yes on this bill, and then they link to their vote. 
Um, so, I mean, I would just like kind of go onto the GA poll hashtag um, and then just go through people and just kind of follow folks that are state representatives because they do a pretty good job of staying active on it. Yes, sir. Um, maybe I'm jumping too far. We're looking at the Understanding the Democracy Act here. Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's you? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, by the way, the handouts that y'all have is for the second part of the presentation last stuff. <clears throat> Could you repeat that last thing you said about GA poll? Is that? Yeah, the hashtag GA poll. Mm -hmm. um, you type that in your search bar, mm -hmm. and then you can search by people. So it'll show up to people who like tweet on that top, like, hashtag pretty much and then it'll pop up and much shows will pop up. So I was just wondering kind of what you see as like the main legislative priorities heading into the second session in 2020. In 2020. So um, our legislative priorities for the Democrats, you know, we're always going to stand up and fight for them. It's a little tough because we're in the minority. Um, Medicaid expansion is our number one issue. Um, that's going to be something that we are going to continue to talk about. We think it's going to be very important in the upcoming session. Um, you know, school safety is another big one for us. Um, you know, we want to make sure that kids are safe in school and we're not having to deal with the tra tragedy every other day. Um, and then things like, a lot of it is defense. So, you know, last session we had a good number of bills that were harmful where we had to kind of play defense against, you know, try to do what we could and make the case against them. Um, unfortunately, that's well, all we can do. We can't really put it down. Um, but, um, you know, that's kind of now with the election year coming up. Um, folks, I think, are kind of waiting to see, you know, do they continue on this path where it's kind of digging your heels in and doing red meat because it's, ele it's election season. So everybody wants to like rile up their base, everybody wants to, you know, get folks paying attention. Um, or do they kind of mellow out a little bit, trying to, you know, see, mitigate what could happen, the harm that could happen to them in 2020 in terms of losing seats. Because um, I think that that's what they have on their mind. I just don't know how legislatively they kind of react to that. Um, so it's, you know, it's going to be an interesting session. Yes, where, where do you see um, <clears throat> odd places where uh, the Democrats can flip the districts? So our there's a lot of seats in the in the suburbs. Um, there are a few seats outside of the metro area. Um, so you know you have Warner Robins, you have Milledgeville, Americus, Athens, seat in Savannah. Um, so like you have a little bit in the south, um, and then the sub like the suburbs, um, a few in South Atlanta, and then mostly North Fulton, Cobb County, and Gwinnett. Um, that is really the next frontier, um, and you know we've been noticing, you know the problem, the issue that we had to deal with, you know in 2017 was a lot of these districts didn't have anybody running them for like a decade. And so we didn't have the data to say whether or not the seat is trending our way, you know, do we have a baseline? We didn't have any of that. Um, so we had folks stepping up in these districts that were traditionally Republican. Um, you know, Democrat hadn't run in 10, 15 years. Um, and then once we put, on, put a Democrat in the seat, you know, we were able to flip that seat. Um, it helps when people have a choice. Um, because it gets people out there, it gets people engaged. Because, you know, I've heard so many times uh, well, you know, I just never had a choice before. I didn't even really bother to come out and do X, Y, Z, or I just always voted for the incumbent and never had a choice. Um, uh, our priority is to make sure that we have people in those seats giving, making the Democratic argument, basically, to say this is what we believe in, this is what we want to fight for. Um, basically, this is the contrast between, because now it's becoming, the contrast is becoming much more clearer than it's ever been. Um, so, you know, mostly the suburbs area, and then now it's starting to kind of trend because as people start moving further and further, uh, the more, because I mean, like, you look at Alfred, like, I grew up in East Cobb. I never in my life would have ever thought East Cobb would have been a competitive district, ever. And now I look around, I'm like, oh, this is it. This is awesome. <laughs> this is fantastic. But it just shows that how important it is to have people get out there and talk to their constituents because, I mean, I've also heard so many times where I don't know who my state representative is. And these people have been living in the district for 20 years. 
My parents have been in that district for 20 plus years. They had never heard from their state representative, ever. And so now it's, you know, time to, time to challenge him. Because if he's not talking to his constituents, asking them what they need, what they want, do they agree, disagree, I mean, what kind of representation is that? So that's where we can kind of come in and say, we're going to talk to y'all. What do y'all want to know about? What issues do you care about? So, mostly in the suburbs. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. What do you think the Republicans' top legislative uh, issues are going to be for next season? So we keep hearing that RIFRA, which is the Religious uh, Restoration Freedom Act, uh, might make it come back. Uh, that was one of Governor Kemp's promises um, on the campaign trail, and we have been hearing that they're probably going to bring that back. Uh, I'm not sure what else they do. Um, they pretty much did everything that they needed to do this past session. Um, but I think that that one is probably the biggest one. There is go oh, The other thing is going to be they're going to start talking about capping the income tax in Georgia. They want to try to take it from the 6% to 4%, um, which with, you know, I know everybody's been reading about the budget cuts that have been proposed that would pretty much leave a hole in our budget. Making that income tax cap is going to just blow another hole in it. Um, so it's probably going to be a lot of taxation and probably some of the social issues like we're and remind us what RIFRA is, I mean. So RIFRA is the Religious Freedom uh, Restoration Act. Um, so basically it allows businesses or corporations or entities to pretty much say, oh, I can't do X, Y, Z, I can't serve X, Y, Z because of my religious, it's kind of like a religious exemption. Mm -hmm. um, so to say because of my religious relief, I can't do this. Um, and restoration means they used to have that? So I think they just like that's rhetoric. The, the soul. Yeah. Oh, okay. so <laughs> right. So there was a federal um, statute that was passed in the '90s that pretty much outlined, you know, it's religious. But I mean, it was never intended to allow people to discriminate. This would allow people to discriminate. Um, so I mean, yeah, that's like their um, their packaging to make it look nice and sound, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. sound nice. Typical. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be an interesting session. Um, you know, the last year, uh, it was just like out of the gate, campaign promises left and right, left and right. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they react now. Um, you know, I've heard either they know that the chamber is going to flip, or they think that they're just going to like dig their heels in and stay on course. Yes, sir. I'm a little bit curious okay. uh, about the way the RIF was written. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that a person working for a business can refuse to perform a job that their the business they work for asks them to because they say that it violates their religious sensibilities? So that I'm not sure. I haven't seen the like most current version, uh, but I think that I'm not 100% sure, but it basically gives people the right to say, it was my religious belief, uh, I don't want anything to do yeah, with it. Right, right, but you're talking about the, the actual corporate, does it give rights to the corporation or does it give rights to employees? And I'd be very surprised if it gave rights well, to employees. Well, the reason I ask is because the business that I work for mm -hmm. does a fair number of um, jobs for overtly Christian entities. And I am not Christian. And it would be really funny if that passed to just say, I'm sorry, this is against my religious sensibilities, and you're going to have to outsource this to somebody else because I'm not actually going to touch this. Yeah. And um, congratulations, you just cost yourself an additional $40,000 a year. I think your boss would say that his religion supersedes his freedom is going to have you be fired but, now. Yeah. <laughs> Well, except that violates the Civil Rights Act. Well, that's a good point. Well, there's, it's probably like a complicated legal question because then you've got the right to work legislation, which, which basically important. says an employer can fire you for yeah, no reason at all. So how would those yeah. Yeah. intersect? The right to work, um, you can't fire somebody for a prohibited reason. So even in a right to work state, they can't they can't say I'm firing you because you're black. I'm firing you because you're Muslim. It's still so wrong. I'm firing you because you're a woman. They don't have to have a reason. They can no, fire you because it's don't. Tuesday. But they but they can right. but, but yeah. they can't say that the reason is one of these protected reasons. But then they can do it and then right yeah, right they, yeah, they, they can say we're firing 
fire you for whatever when the reason why they fire you is because you're a black Muslim woman um, to combine your all your things. Um, but they can't. They can't yeah. explicitly say. Yeah, it gets into a um, messy legal yeah, legal tricky. battle because you can generally prove that somebody has fired people for prohibited reasons, even if they're giving reasons that are not. Yeah, and I mean, you know, last time they tried to introduce this, I mean, the business community came out in full force against it. Oh, um, because like Delta, Home Depot, Coca-Cola, they all wrote letters saying, uh, no, this is going to be a problem if this passes. It's going to be a big problem. problem. And because their employees, at the end of the day, they're all in Georgia, you know, what are they all well, do? That, you know, you can be a Christian, but there's people that are saying nothing. Right. Right. And there's, those rules apply to them too, so if they don't want to do X, Y, or Z, right. because it's against, I mean, it's going to get missing. Right. Um, yeah. But I think that this is something that's like campaign rhetoric, and they're like, oh, it sounds nice, and it sounds like we're sticking up for Okay. So, yeah, so it's going to be an interesting, uh, it's going to be an interesting thing to watch this year. Um, but, you know, we'll see. This is an interesting time. Georgia is shifting, um, and I think that some of them are aware and some of them are not. Um, Georgia is shifting into a blue state. Um, folks are, you know, folks are starting to pay attention more. And let me tell you, like, this past session, I have never seen, and it warmed my heart, I have never seen people so engaged and involved watching the legislative process. Um, you know, you know, we had bills that passed, like, pretty much the same version, minus a few, you know, limitations. In 2012, not a peep. We didn't get article like we got like an AJC article or maybe the like one rare national article. No protests, no people coming out to camp out, no nothing. This year, watching folks come down and actually pay attention and talk to people and say they're in opposition and say they're for it was on her. I saw it. I was like, people are saying this. this is beautiful. Like this is like this is something that people should be engaged and involved in because it, at the end of the day, it comes down to affecting your lives. Yeah. Um, so I think folks now are kind of checked in and saying, oh, like, okay, like, this is fascinating, but like, this is really important for us to do something and to say something about it. This was really the first year where I saw people step back in and say, oh, they're going to continue talking and come to the table and say something versus, oh, it's just the legislation. Like, it's fine. They'll be fine. Um, I think it was 2016. A lot of people woke up. Yeah. Correct. Um, correct. Um, and so once folks, once 2016 happened, you know, I was one of the ones who was like, okay, let's see if like folks kind of like go back, kind of go back into like their normal uh, setting. And it's been wonderful to watch the energy just continue to rise and rise and rise. And the energy is not finished yet. Um, 2020 is going to be a big year for us. Um, you know, Georgia has two Senate seats at play. Uh, we have a few congressional, you know, the seventh is in play. Um, and then protecting, you know, what we gained in 18, and then trying to further that frontier. Um, so, I mean, it's a very, it's a very interesting thing to watch. Folks kind of like stay engaged and stay fired up. Um, it's something that we need because um, I think without accountability, people just kind of do whatever they want to do. Uh, this is the first time that I think folks have been really been being being told, held accountable. So now you hear people all the time saying, well. I don't know if I want to run for the seat again. I don't know if I want to do this, that, and the other, because they don't want to have to fight for their seat. They don't want to have to fight for their record. Um, you know, at the end of the day, like, I'm going to say I'm sorry for the dog. So, um, um, you know, this is stuff that affects people's everyday life. Uh, this stuff is incredibly important, and I love watching folks get engaged uh, and stay engaged and coming to advocate. Um, it's incredibly important. It makes a difference. Um, it's much harder to hear somebody say, no, I don't like this idea in person, versus a form email. Um, so, you know, these representatives, they're human at the end of the day. They're not, you know, they're not robots. They don't shut off and shut, turn on. Um, you know, they have to deal with the stresses. They have to deal with their constituents. They have to deal with, you know, people and their families saying, why did you vote this way? Um, it makes a big difference when you have those conversations with folks. <coughs> any other any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have one other question. Can you kind of, based on your experience, give give everybody a feel for like how effective it is, kind of on a scale of like when you're talking to your reps, if like I'm concerned in whatever, versus like if I just you know send an email versus if I call or if I meet them here in in the district or if I go down there and actually meet during them during the session. Yeah. So for me, like email email is good. 
but email kind of gets lost in the chaos and the noise. Um, especially if there's like an issue, and like let me tell y'all, we had one issue one year, I think it was to classify pit bulls as a dangerous breed, which like didn't go anywhere. That was the most time that I've ever seen people send in emails. We got about like 300 plus emails for that issue. We didn't get emails about education, we didn't get emails about Camp Scary, we didn't get emails about that. So it depends. Like if it's an issue like that where it's kind of going to get lost in the noise, because people just start sending form emails, and it's at that point it's like, okay, one, two, three, you just kind of count. Um, a phone call is good outside of session because that way you can kind of like set a time to like actually dedicate and set up to meet somebody. Um, I love the meeting, the district, the representative meeting in the district because you're their constituent, mm -hmm. and so you're a vote. And so they have an incentive to come and say, sit down, have a cup of coffee with you to say, okay, let's talk about these issues. Um, during session, um, if there's like a particular issue going through and like you're in Atlanta, um, definitely go and visit. Like go to the Capitol, go stop by their office. Um, sometimes it's a little tougher because like if they're in session, they're just like not in their office. Um, but usually, like, I know my folks, like, we'll tell folks, say, oh, he's not in the office right now, they're on the floor, they're in session, if you want to go across the street, go, you know, write down a piece of paper and then pull him out on the, off the floor. Um, and having that conversation, it's a little bit shortened because, you know, either they're voting, they have to listen to the debate, they're being pulled from, like, 20 different directions, so that's like an elevator speech where, like, you have maybe two minutes to talk about whatever issue you need to talk about. Definitely the like contact them and reaching their office and saying, hey, listen, I'm a constituent. I'd love to grab a cup of coffee. Because that way you'll at least have, you know, a good dedicated amount of time to sit down and talk to them where they're not being pulled from 30 different directions. The go to talk to them in session, because I mean that's just convenient because they're in session. And so they're like literally right there on the house floor about to take a vote where you can go sit down and talk to them uh, about the issue. But it's just like a very short and elevator speech. Uh, but definitely the one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, and get to know your state representatives. Like, I very much highly encourage building a relationship with that person so that you can come, go to them and say, hey, listen, like, what are your thoughts on this bill? Why is this this way? Why are you looking at it this way? Here's my opinion. It might make a difference at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, they'll vote the way that they want to vote. Uh, but I think it does make a difference because it's just an extra added voice from other folks that they're already hearing, I'm sure, saying, either agree or disagree on this one. Got a follow-up to that? Yeah. Is, do, you, do you think it's useful for people to contact um, representatives who aren't in their district? It depends. Um, so say a representative has a bill and they're the author. I would encourage people to contact that author uh, because they're the ones who are pushing it through. They're the ones who are you know, leading the charge on getting the bill passed. Uh, a lot of times, if it's like, uh, hey, I want you to vote no on this, I'll, you know, people will tally it up. Um, they won't necessarily take a look if it's their constituent or not, but if it's, say, you have an issue and you wanted to grab coffee with them, that one might be a little bit, unless like, it's like pertaining to that particular legislation, that one they might be like, well, you might want to talk to your state representative over me. Uh, so it just depends. But if it's like something pertaining to a bill, I would definitely encourage folks to reach out and say, hey, like, what, what are you doing with this bill? Like, either for or against it. Um, so, this makes sense. Any other, do I have one more? Do I have time? Okay. All right. Well. All right, y'all. But thank y'all for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I really appreciate y'all coming out today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, next we have Miss Judy Krebs from uh, Lunk and Indivisible, so she's going to do a PowerPoint for us. <laughs> You're good. So, let's give a round of applause for Judy. I'm going to ask you guys, if you have any questions, just kind of like write them down and try to hold them unless they're just like burning a hole. But I know like when I have a question, if I don't ask it right away, I don't remember. So I'm going to give you some stuff on which to write them down. And I have some pencils. Do people need pencils to pens? There's some pens. In case you need a pen. Okay. Good. 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 Projector is what we are. We are connecting with projector right now. <laughs>
We are. I'm here to talk to you about uh, Fair Districts Georgia, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan group that everybody should be very interested in. This ties in excellently with what Falak was telling you in a couple of, of instances. Um, it's very, very important the work they do, which is talking about redistricting and why it is of the utmost importance to everybody. This is kind of a, an old projection system here, so you should have been like going down memory lane into the 1990s here with this system, but we'll get there eventually. Um, the information packets that you guys have in front of you, um, I'm sorry that I didn't have enough for everybody, but there are some. The most important one is this one everybody should have because it tells you how to get more information on it. And it's a little piece that says, for more information about transparent, nonpartisan redistricting in Georgia, and it looks like this. So if you need one of those, that tells you where you can get pretty much everything else that's figured it out. And one other thing while we're working on this, what happened here? Should I get a pen? Do you have to have a Sure. I do have more pens. Anybody else need more pens? There's also a sign-in sheet that I appreciate everybody signing. It has a sign in. Who needed this pet stuff? Yeah. 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 Ye
So welcome to this presentation. It is called Redistricting Reform in Georgia. What can we do about it? So I'm going to talk first of all about some problems that we have with gerrymandering and redistricting. I'm going to define those sort of things and then I'm going to present a fabulous solution that we actually have kind of in place. It's in committees and it's something that we really hope to get through in the 2020 legislative session here in Georgia. This is talking about what we can do here in Georgia. So it's really important that everybody who's in this room can actually help and do things, whether it's write postcards, whether it's talk to your reps, whether it's take a training like I did, because I'm just an invisible leader, right? I took a training from Fair Districts Georgia, this organization, so that I can like spread the gospel about it to groups like yourselves and to others. So there's a lot that we all can do about it. And I'm just going to give you that overview so that, you know, when it starts looking dark two-thirds of the way through, remember there's light at the end of this tunnel. <laughs> Fair District Georgia is a 501c4 nonpartisan organization. Now, nonpartisan means that it does not pertain to any political party, no how, no way, okay? And this whole thing that I'm going to be talking to you about, redistricting, is a, and the solution that we have here in Georgia that we can implement with enough political will is a nonpartisan issue. And I'm going to tell you why redistricting is a bad thing for any political party, for both political parties. We really have a two party system here, frankly. Right? That's what we're going to be talking about. So it's important to know that this is a no, that Fair Districts Georgia is a nonpartisan organization. We're working to end electoral map rigging here in Georgia. The focus is on redistricting reform to ensure competitive districts. Because when they're competitive, people <coughs> show up to vote. There's a reason. Your votes matter. And to fight gerrymandering, which is, as you know, the practice of drawing legislative districts so that basically the politicians are the ones selecting the votes and not the other way around, the voters selecting the politicians. The ultimate goal of Fair Districts Georgia is to reform Georgia's process for drawing electoral maps uh, at the state and for federal offices as well, for the U.S. Congress in Georgia. Um, okay. There are resources available from Fair Districts Georgia. Everybody should have a copy of, I'm going to just steal this from you, of this one right here, <laughs> this contact sheet here, which is basically the information that's, that's presented here. It gives Fair Districts Georgia's website. They have a ton of information on there. There's also a really great, if you guys like watching John Oliver, he does a great job talking about gerrymandering and redistricting um, and presents it in a very compelling manner. And then there's many, many other resources from various publications that you can find um, on, on that website or, or elsewhere just by Googling it. We're going to talk about what is redistricting, how does it affect our elections, what is gerrymandering? Why is it a problem? And what can we do about it? And where can we start? So let's start right in with what is redistricting? How does it affect our elections? We live in a representative, representational democracy. So fundamentally, if the representation this is where it's going to get challenging. If the representation is off, then the democracy is not working. That's it. It's really simple. And it doesn't matter what party you're from. It cuts two ways with this one. Our election, our election system depends on our right to be representative. What is redistricting? Well, we've got, and we're going to be looking at this map. This is, do you guys know what this is? <coughs> You've seen this before, I'm sure. This is the Georgia map. The colors are the 14 congressional districts. Those are the districts for the U.S. House of Representatives in Georgia. Now, at the Senate level, we elect, as a state, statewide two senators. So it doesn't matter if you live in Pickens County or Lumpkin County or you know Chatham County, everybody's voting for the two senators. But at the House seats and for the Georgia legis legislative seats, it does matter where you live. And that's what we're going to be talking about here. Not the U.S. Senate, but we're talking about congressional seats, mostly in my example. So you guys are here over in Pickens, up here in Georgia 9, up, up here. <laughs> Uh, and we're going to be looking at this map. So the party in power is the one that gets to draw the lines. That's the way it works. It's like to the victors go the spoils of the war. Uh, the way we do this redistricting is after a census, every 20 years it's mandated by the U.S. Constitution. There is a count, there's a population, and then there's redistricting based on the results of the census. So when's the next census? Who knows? Next year. Next year. Guess what's going to happen if we don't have fair districts? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing good <laughs> for either party, really, but definitely 
Um, it's a time when this needs to be revised and to be instituted as, as fair districts for everybody. So, what is the effect on Georgia elections when we have districts that are not fairly drawn? Why are they not fairly drawn? Because the people in power want to stay in power. They draw the lines to give themselves and members of their party safe seats, seats that aren't competitive, states, seats where somebody's not likely to run because, you know, so-and-so has been doing it for 30 years and nobody ever runs against them because what's even the point, okay? When that, who's had an election like that? Uh -huh. yeah. Right, I'm from Lincoln, so like, I mean, there's been plenty of times I go and vote anyway, but there's times when you're just like, there is nobody here I want to vote for, and I'm going to write somebody in, or there's nobody, but there's like one candidate running. It's terrible. Yeah. So this is the problem. This is the problem. So what happens when that happens? In the 2016 election, district lines were drawn to favor one party to the point of 81% of the legislative seats were uncontested. Right, that's just wrong. What happens? Decisions are made in the primaries. Other parties <coughs> don't have candidates to run because what's even the point, right? I mean, it's decided before we even start. The game's rigged. People don't turn out to vote because, again, you feel like your vote doesn't even matter. So what is even the point? Exactly. Redistricting when it's gone awry like this is called gerrymandering, and it is a problem for representational democracy. Well, Everybody has heard of gerrymandering, right? Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a practice of manipulating district boundaries to create an advantage or disadvantage for a specific group of people. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen these crazy looking shapes. Um, the history behind that, I'll show you in a couple slides. There's a reason why it was called like that, because it was like a salamander, and they called it a gerrymander after the guy named Gary. <laughs> now, these partisan gerrymandering is still legal in the U.S. Racial gerrymandering, which is like putting all the people of a specific race or a specific religion, well, at least I don't know about religious gerrymandering, that's still out there. Racial gerrymandering definitely got struck down by the Supreme Court in the Voting Rights Act, so in theory, <laughs> in theory. But the way to get around that is that now people just say, well, it's not racial, it's political. And here we are. So we get some strange looking districts, okay? Gerrymandering can create some very absurd looking districts that are blatantly unfair, but it can also create normal looking ones that are unfair. You can have one that's square or slightly blobby like that, and it can also be unfair. It doesn't have to be ones that look like this. But it's important to point out that not all of these weirdly shaped districts are gerrymandered, that are a bad thing. For example, I'm going to give you two examples here. This is Georgia 11. This is from the 1990s. So Georgia 11 now looks a lot different than that. It's much smaller. But in the 1990s, this is Atlanta. This is Augusta. Mm -hmm. This is Savannah. Mm -hmm. And this is 250 miles. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that was one congressional district. That is what we call <coughs> racial gerrymandering. Because what they did here is they took black communities in uh, parts of Atlanta, parts of Augusta, parts of Savannah, and then this rural part here, which had a lot of, of black people living in it in a rural setting. People who had nothing in common with the people in this urban setting of Savannah, who had nothing in common with the urban setting of Augusta, who had very little in common with the urban setting up in Atlanta. And they said, well, y'all are black people, so we're just going to put you all together. Okay? Now, that was struck down by the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court. This one here is Illinois Congressional District 4, which you can see this is often trotted out a lot because it has this crazy shape of this little tiny strip tied together here between it. The thing to think about here, these are two Latino, majority Latino districts that vote Democratic with a largely black district in between that also votes Democratic. What's going on here though is the scale of miles across here. From here to here is about seven and a half miles. And in this case, what was done is that this district was kind of gerrymandered, but it was drawn to keep communities of interest together. That is, that the people here in this community had a lot of close ties and shared interests with the people up here in this community. And so it made sense in this case to actually put those two people together because they had differences that weren't necessarily equal to the people that were in the middle. So every time you see something that's crazy shaped, you can go, it's gerrymandered, but not everything that's gerrymandered is bad. It's complicated. It's complicated. So how does it work when you gerrymander things? Well, 
Here's a great example. And we're going to do one here. We have a little example we can do here. There's two principal tactics that are used in partisan gerrymandering. In this example, there are red and blue dots. We have 64 of them. So you can see there's, there's 32 red dots, 32 blue dots, arranged kind of whatever. And you can just pretend <coughs> these are people in the blue party and the red party, or elephants and turtles, or I don't know, whatever you want to consider them, two different types of cats, whatever we can talk about. Um, and when you split it up, we're talking about splitting this hypothetical group of whatevers into four. So when you split it up this way, we have four competitive districts because in each one of these, there are 16 voters and there are the same number of blue ones as the same number of red ones. So that means when there's a race, we don't know what the odds are going to be and generally the best person or the one who has the most compelling agenda is going to win. That's exciting. That would make me want to go out. Wouldn't it make you guys want to go out? Because like, who knows what's going to happen? But is that what happens? No. What usually happens is we have two things that are the two main tactics that are used in partisan gerrymander. One is called packing and the other is called cracking. So packing means you want to take all of a similar voting block and put them as close together as you can. You want to maximize them into a single district. So in this case, here's packing. You've got all the red votes in this district here. This is a solid red district. It's got the same number of votes as the other three districts, but this one is always going to be red. That is never going to be blue at this, unless these voters start changing. It ain't going to happen. So people do that for a specific reason. In cracking, what you do is you take your, you want to dilute that particular voting block. So you want to crack it up into as many, split it up into as many different ones as possible. You can see that there are cases where people might want to pack and then crack this and crack that and pack that. So this is how it's done. This is how the game is played. Um, I have a little example just to show you of how we can play the little game. Does anybody want to do a little? Example, do I have a willing participant? Come on, somebody come up. I did this to a high school, and my high school kids came up to do it. Who wants to do it? You can do it. A brave soul. So in this one, we have 54 little dots. There's pink dots and green dots, because red and blue sort of have meaning anymore. Um, and so we're going to divide these into, thir into three districts. So just kind of, I'm, I'm going to show you first thing. If we divide it this way, like this, can you guys all see it? Let me scoot just right over here and then most people can see it now. So if we divide it like that, we have three competitive districts, which means we've got the same number of pink and green, which is like the first case here. So that's great. People come out to vote because who knows what's going to happen. The best person for the job is going to win, we hope. But now you're going to gerrymander. And keep in mind that you have been gerrymandering for approximately 20 seconds now. So let's just see how fast this is with just yield magic marker. So we're going to divide it into three. So see if you can divide it into like, you know, put all into sections where all the pink people can get a majority vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. and I'll help you count. Yep, there's one. Okay. And then like, you've got to have two more districts. Okay. So, um, go ahead. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So you're just going to just draw this around here so that, okay, there we go. Perfect. All right. So now just split those other two districts up into something. Yeah, there we go. Look at that. How long that take? Who's been timing this? <laughs> Not long. 15 seconds, right? Okay. So here we have packed this district here. We have a majority pink district, right? No matter what green does, pink's going to win because that's how we packed it. But over here, let's see what we've got here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. This one's going to go pink. Mm -hmm. I mean, still, also we pack this one. This one's going to go green, mm -hmm. right? So I've got this one. So these two, I mean, it depends on how you look at it. If we've, you know, packed the pink ones here, and we've cracked the green, or vice versa like that. But you guys get the idea, right? You can absolutely, this woman here, let's give her a hand. <laughs> that with a pen and just doing math, right? You can imagine what the problem is now because we have supercomputers and so much data. Yeah, it's horrifying, right? That was our example. So here's an actual example besides just this one of what it looks like. We're going to look at a couple 
uh, congressional districts. Here's Georgia 6 here, which is, is that you? Are you 6? Or no, in East Cobb? No. Um, yes, that's yes. Six. Six. Okay. <laughs> happened to be because you're, you're in East Cobb, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to also look at what's going on in the town of Athens over here. So here's Georgia 6 right here. This is kind of a weird shaped district. So we've got parts of East Cobb. We've got extreme North Fulton. We've got this little bit of DeKalb over here. And, and here's this other big blob of North Fulton County up here. So who knows what are the distinguishing characteristics of this voting block? Who's got a guess? Anybody? Mm -hmm. It's suburban Atlanta professional. It's suburban Atlanta. Rich yeah, and white. Rich and it's white. rich and it's white. Right. This is Johns Creek, right? It's right out here now. Mm -hmm. Extreme out here. East Cobb, pretty rich and white. North Fulton. Fulton County got extended way out the way out here because they wanted to like actually gerrymander the, the shape of Fulton County mm -hmm. itself to include all this stuff out here because you know, here's Fulton County in Atlanta. It goes way up here. So that's what's going on in Georgia 6. So what's going on in Georgia 6, the way it is right now, is it has been drawn to produce the results that rich white people want. Now, that hasn't always been the case. So there's been some changing, and that's a surprise. So one of the things that I suggest may be happening is people may be looking at redrawing that when it comes to census time to make sure that they're always getting the result they want. But it's important to keep in mind what's going on with these things. Here's another one that's been gerrymandered. This is the 9th district. This is Clark County here. This is the city of Athens, right here on the border. Mm -hmm. So half, literally half the city of Athens is in Georgia 9, which skews very conservative, and the other half is down here in Georgia 10. And they've just diluted, they have cracked that voting block of Athens into two dis congressional districts to dilute it. So you can see that is a problem that's going on right now. Um, as I told you, there was, it, this is something that has been going on as long as we've had politics. We've had gerrymandering. In the 1780s, it started with a Republican Patrick Henry, at least like on paper. And then this guy named Gary, Eldridge Gary, designed this crazy looking district in Massachusetts. And some wag said, oh, it looks like a salamander. And so here we have <laughs> gerrymandering, which we know is gerrymandering. That's the history of it. The thing is about gerrymandering is it is a double-edged sword. And the party in power, which is, or the party that's more precisely, the party that has drawn the lines, okay, is the one that benefits. Now, if that is not your party, then you tend to not like the results. For example, Ronald Reagan was uh, drawn out of his district in California when majority Democrats did the gerrymandering. Both parties do this, okay? Nobody likes it. There is a solution to this, and it's fair and nonpartisan redistricting. And that's what we're going to be talking about in the last third of this PowerPoint. What we want is we want ideal congressional districts. This is a hypothetical map that was put together back in 2012 by uh, Fair Districts Georgia. So ideal congressional districts are contiguous, trying to get out of your way, um, which is already required by the Con Georgia Constitution. So that's why sometimes you had that big long thing. You couldn't just say, here's black people up here, and here's black people over here, and here's black people over there. They had to all connect them. Or here's rich white, white people here, and rich white people here, and rich white people here. They have to be connected. That is a constitutional requirement here in Georgia. But districts that are ideal should also be compact, and they should be competitive. Remember our little example? That means that we shouldn't be able to know what the outcome of that election is going to be in advance, because then what is even the point? And they should be representative of the community for which they are representative. They should look like where we're from. Are our districts representative? Do they give, give citizens and citizen groups a say? Not so much right now. So let's go look back at our examples again. Here's the actual ones in the map I showed you, right? Here's Georgia 6, this green bit here. And here's Athens split between two congressional districts. Under this hypothetical case, and this is just one of, of very many ways that, that these things can be redrawn, but this is a hypothetical map that we already have now. This is, this is George 6, and you can see that George 6 now looks a little bit different. It includes everybody out here in the northern parts of Cobb County because these people all have stuff in common, but not these people down here in DeKalb as much. They don't have as much. They have more in common with these people out here, which is probably Gwinnett out here, than they do with these people here. So they've kept the communities of interest together. And here you can see that this is Clark County, this shape here, and Athens now is not divided up because, you know, people who live in Athens should 
be with the other people who live in Athens, right? It's just one city. Why would we like surgically slice and dice that up? Gerrymandering undermines our democracy. It's cheating. Why? Every vote doesn't count equally. Why does that happen? What does that do to people? People say, my vote's wasted. Why should I even bother to show up? It discourages voter turnout for the same reasons. People are like, what's even the point? Why do I go to polls? It's predetermined. There's no point showing up. Incumbents don't need to listen to all the constituents. This is super important, mm -hmm. here, right? Mm -hmm. Because, like, why do we care what you have to say? Because I don't care even if you are my constituent, because I know that I've drawn this so that whatever you have to say doesn't matter, because I've got my base over here, and my base is what's going to reelect me every single time. So if you're a dissenter, so it, it doesn't hold your representatives accountable. I'm only responsible when my party members choose me in the primary. I don't care what you think. And it leads, at, at the end goal, to extreme partisanship and the lack of bipartisan problem solving. That's what happens. So it's a really bad deal. And it's a bad deal, again, for both parties, because it just makes the whole system of representational democracy stop working. Why is it so important today? Well, we just discussed that. She did a great job gerrymandering 20 seconds with a marker, right? Can you imagine what we can do now with big data? Can you imagine what happens now with the extreme partisanship that we have in the country? Really? And because, really importantly, the 2020 census is coming up. And the 2020 census is what's going to be the deciding factor for how districts are redrawn going into 2021. There have been recent efforts at gerrymandering in Georgia. <laughs> All three of these people have been drawn out of their districts. John Barrow was drawn out of his district three different times. He had to keep moving while he was running for election. <laughs> so it happens again to Republicans. It happens to Democrats. Both sides do it, and it's bad. I know a lot of people tend to say, like, oh, well, when my party gets in you know, power, it's going to be great because we're going to redraw the lines. Well, no. <laughs> Because then the other party will get back into power later on, and then they'll do it. And it's not fair, right? It's just not fair. What we want is some foundational fix to this system. So quit rigging it one way, quit rigging it the other way. It needs to be a fair and representational system for what the people want. Mm -hmm. Georgia. <laughs> so this is Shelby V. Holder in 2013. Um, this is really complicated, I'm just going to gloss over it. But part of the Voting Rights Act was struck down in Georgia, which was that we were one of the states where we had to get prior approval before we did any kind of redistricting reform. Well, that got changed in 2013 as a result of Shelby V. Holder. And so now the Georgia Assembly does small redistricting every single year. They can do it, and they don't have to get it checked, and they do do it. Absolutely, they do it. In 2017, we had uh, HB 515 that was written to change two competitive districts to protect incumbents. They tried to pass it through at the end of the season. I bet you can talk all about that. <laughs> what happened? Well, they tried to have a hearing about it towards the end of the season. They tried to have the hearing at 7.30 in the morning. Mm. They tried to have four police officers standing in the back just in case people got unruly about representational democracy not occurring. But people showed up anyway. Look at all these fierce people showing up at 7.30 in the morning. There were over 200 people in that hearing room. And, pe and when the light was shown on what was going on, the people were like, the, the legislators were like, oh, we're just kidding. <laughs> and they dropped it. They tried it again in 2019. I mean, there's probably a couple more. This one was something that they really got slapped on. There was a deal between a Republican and a Democrat. They co-sponsored a bill to redraw the lines in between them. What happened was that the Republican wanted his seat to be safer, and the Democrat was just like, he's like, come on, just give me some of your seats, because you're going to get reelected anyway. And, and they were like, she was like, OK, absolutely, sure, no problem. But the problem with that was is that that made his seat less competitive, and it also made hers, uh, well, it made his unflippable, and it made hers less competitive. So they both got, like, just nailed on that one, and they're like, we're sorry, we were just kidding again, and they dropped it, and it was withdrawn. Um, 
the result of this is that citizens do have power, and it is critically important that, you know, even so I was asking you about, like, people showing up. People show up and they start talking. You show up for the hearings if you need to. You call them, you write postcards, you just say, I'm paying attention. And then they like, oh, well, maybe we should watch what we're doing. Nobody likes gerrymandering. I'm telling you. <laughs> Nobody likes gerrymandering. Well, Schwarzenegger, though, was married to Maria Schreiber. And he pushed a lot of Republican things at first, and he got a lot of backlash. And he really changed his tune. I mean, he's been much more of a, he was much more of a Democrat as, uh, you know, towards the end of his governorship. Well, what can we do about gerrymandering? Where do we start? There are some different solutions we can try. We can just try suing them and taking them to court. That is not ideal because, first of all, it takes forever, and the courts don't always uh, rule your way. The recent cases in Maryland and North Carolina uh, went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court basically said, you know what, that seems like it's a state problem, so sorry, we're not going to say anything about it. So the state decisions or the federal court decisions uh, were upheld. Um, as we talked about earlier, as I said earlier, about you know racial gerrymandering, just saying like all of these color people here and all of these color people here and all of those color people there, that technically is illegal. They get around it all the time by saying, well, we're just going to do partisan gerrymandering, which is completely legal, uh, and that still occurs. But there have been some successes um, in just getting a, a, a stronger uh, redistricting solution in place. For example, there have been solutions at the state level. Uh, there have been a number of states that have already instituted independent, bipartisan redistricting commissions. And that's what I'm going to be talking about is the solution that we have here in Georgia. Um, there are states that have already passed anti-gerrymandering ballot initiatives. And then there are um, a number of court cases that are still going on. There was something that just happened in Virginia. Are you guys paying attention to what just happened in Virginia in the elections just now? Virginia had one of these uh, was one of the states that had court case that was saying that you guys are basically racial gerrymandering things and that is illegal and you shouldn't be doing it. And it went up and then went back, went up to the Supreme Court. They said we're not going to listen to it. The federal court decision stood, and so Virginia had to redraw their districts. And then they had competitive elections, and everything changed in Virginia. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is that. People were paying attention and saying, like, this isn't right. Like, the people should be electing the politicians, not the other way around. What do we have here? The solution is called the Democracy Act. And that's a bunch of the stuff that you have on the paperwork. And again, if you didn't get the paperwork, you can see it and read it for yourself at the Fair District Georgia website. It is a resolution that is in both houses right now. It's, it's got uh, a different number in the House. And in, this is at the Georgia level. This is the state level. So it's state Senate Resolution SR52, HR 369. And it requires three really important key components. We have a transparent process. Remember what we were talking about? Like every time you start showing light on these things, they back off. And people, when, when the citizens like us, start seeing what the politicians are going up to trying to rig the system, they tend to back off. So first of all, it's important, it's key that the, that the process is transparent. That means that we can see what's going on, that we have input to it, that the meetings are public, and that it's intuitive and understandable, that we can understand what the heck they're talking about. And if we can't, or if we have a problem with it, we can say, excuse me, and have input to it, and they have to respond to it. That is a transparent process. This is critical. We have to have standards for what those fair districts are. And everybody needs to be able to understand them, to provide input to them, and to be able to read them and see what they are. We need to have an independent citizens redistricting commission. Uh, and we're going to talk about how that works right here. So this is what the Democracy Act basically includes. There's a number of issues on it, but basically it's transparent. All meetings of this commission are held in public. No secret meetings, no matter what. You can go to the meetings. You cannot go to the meetings. You can have somebody can, can live stream them on Facebook or record them like we're doing here. There are transcripts. You know what's going on at the meetings. Citizens can learn about the maps, the districting 
the redistricting maps that are proposed. Citizens can understand uh, via an internet portal that's accessible to everybody what we're looking at. What's the data that we're looking at for redrawing these? How, what is the process used for? What is the thinking behind of it? All of that is available to the public. You can look at it if you want to or not because everybody's busy, but at least the thing is out there and that people who are interested and want to have the time are, are able to look at it and to comment on it and they have to take that into account. We also have standards for drawing those districts. They can't favor any political party. They can't favor any incumbent. They can't use your political information or voting history or other many other types of data. Because remember, we're talking about big data now. They know everything. I mean, I'm not trying to be paranoid here, but you know, if you've got cell phones, they all know you're sitting here right now, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to ask you to like, how was the Pickens County Library? Would you like to rate it on a scale of one to five for Google? Um, but, but. The Democracy Act says that we can't draw those districts to limit the rights of any citizen based on the race of that person, based on the color of that person, their language, their minority status, their home address, their voting history. There's a whole list of things that you cannot use to draw that. So you are just basically looking at population and a couple other factors to draw your districts. That makes them a lot more fair and a lot harder to be manipulated for political gain. And most importantly, well, or equally, try importantly, the redistricting commission is made up of an independent, independent citizens commission. So the suggested format right now, which is in the Democracy Act, is that we have 14 people on it. Five of them are Republicans, five of them are Democrats. Those two groups, those 10 people get together and they choose four independents. Um, and that is the format of, of this committee. So, right, so we have equal numbers of people on this thing. It's aimed to be nonpartisan. People who are chosen to be on this cannot be a legislator, a president, or a recent seat holder. Um, they must be uh, citizens. Uh, they must be able to have, um, they, they must be able to work with this timetable that we have. So it's not somebody who can say like, oh, I'm just going to do this part time and I'll be able to, to commit sufficient time to it. Um, and they must agree that they are going to follow the transparent rules and standards that were put into place by the actual rest part of the Democracy Act. And then there's an approval process for doing it. And this is really key on the bottom part. The Democracy Act limits the redistricting in Georgia to every 10 years. Because you remember what I said about them? We, we, Shelby B. Holder let us get rid of the prior approval of the Department of Justice for Voting Rights Act when we start moving districting around. So every year they tweak stuff. But under this, they wouldn't have to do it. That would free up so much time from citizens like us who have to sit there and keep our eyes on these guys when we all have other things to do. I mean, most of us probably have other things to do rather than watching what these guys are trying to get up to. Um, and so this would be great. You would only have to tune in once every 10 years to check out what they're going on to. And this is great. This is based again on the census. Just makes sense. There is an urgent time frame for this, which is why this is so important, and I hope that everybody is really fired up about this critical issue and wants to, to help. And that is, is that what is basically required is that the Democracy Act has to be passed by a constitutional amendment in Georgia. That's just the way it has to work. And to do that, we basically have to get that on the ballot in 2020. So that's coming up really fast. We're in November of 2019. Mm -hmm. So we really need everybody to dig in on this, to tell your friends, to read up about it, to say this is really important. We need to stop rigging our democracy. We need to make sure that the people get to choose the politicians, not the other way around. It's a nonpartisan issue. It's best for democracy in Georgia and everywhere. We've got to get this on the ballot. It's again, it's already a resolution in the House in Georgia and in the state Senate in Georgia. They have to be able to make it out of committee to get passed and then to cross over and to get put onto the ballot so we can vote on it in 2020. So it's tight. It's tight, but it's doable. Where can you start? Well, you can find a like-minded group. For example, Fair Districts Georgia or many others that I'm sure you can think of. You can educate yourself with the information you have here. You can talk to your friends. You can write postcards. You can talk to your legislators. Um, you can have parties where you talk about this. You can talk to the people at Fair Districts Georgia. They are happy to come up here and do a training. We did one 
we being indivisible Lumpkin and the Lumpkin County Dems, um, co-hosted people from Fair District Georgia to come up and train a whole room full of people in just what I showed you, but also how to do what I'm doing, because I was just like a person in the audience, and I was like, this is really important. So now I'm trying to go out and give the presentation, and I can talk about it to you guys. In the end, the elections belong to all of us, and it's up to all of us to make sure that, that you know, our votes count, and our votes count equally. And that's why we need to have a fair and transparent redistricting process. So that's all of my talking. And now, I will see if any of you guys have any questions. Yes, ma'am. I have two. Um, how does uh, the districting in the state uh, impact the U.S. districting? In other words, they're not... The congressional districts for the U.S. House aren't the same as the state districts, are they? No. So this would, this would, so, but, but redistricting process occurs at both. So the maps that I showed you were for federal, for mm -hmm. the House seats, right. right? And so that's one type of redistricting. But there's also a redistricting that goes on for, you know, your representative versus my representative, or your senators versus my senators, et cetera, at the state level. This bill, because it would be an amendment to the Georgia Constitution, would cover, all of it. Would cover both of them with the same independent commission transparent standards. What are the, the other question I had are, you mentioned all the factors that couldn't be used to district. What are the factors that they do use to redistrict? I am going to refer you to the literature on that because there's a bunch of them, and you should have one piece of paper. I don't know if I get there. It could be on this one. Um, let's see. It's one that's presented landscape that said a reader's guide to understanding the Democracy Act. And that tells you the whole Democracy Act right there, and it's annotated on the side. Oh, okay. Thanks. And that should answer your question. And if it doesn't, you can contact me. I'll put my contact <laughs> information out, and I will find out for you and get back to you in person. Okay. I'm going to go back to him first because he had his hand, and then I'm going to come to you. Yes, sir. Why not remove people from the question entirely? That is, why not have an open source program that can be reviewed by anybody that has programming knowledge? And the only data that can go into the program is geographical um, and the location of the individual voter registration. And so the, the program knows where the county borders are, um, and it knows which voters are located where. But that's the only information that can even go into it. So you can't consider you know, race, age, ethnicity, uh, religion. Um, nothing except physical location. Then you don't even have to worry about whether somebody's like, well, you know, my constituents are rich white people, and, you know, so I'm going to, you know, pack my district with that. Or you don't have to say, well, my, my constituents all happen to really care about, I don't know, uh, abstract expressions part. And so I'm going to pack my district with people that are into abstract expressionism. Um, so that you know we can get a new modern art museum or something. Which would be cool, probably. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. it, it would be, but at the same time, okay. you know, if I hear if you. it is done without any human involvement, then you can't, you know, where there's no data that can be considered, you know, where you don't have somebody saying, well, I know I'm not allowed to consider this, but I know yeah. this thing, so I'm going to kind of sneak that in there. So I would say two things. First of all. Um, Anything can be hacked. Yeah. Well, okay. Right, but that's why you make it open source so that it can all. And second be thing is, like, you probably know what you're talking about. <laughs> I have a master's degree, but it's in geology. But I have no clue what, like, you can say open source, and I understand that if I go there and I can type it, it'll be like a bunch of lines that say stuff. And I have no hope ever <laughs> of having that make sense, even though I took programming like eons ago, but it just like, I think it makes sense to some people, but it doesn't make sense to people who aren't in that particularly, you know, niche area. Um, and that's why I would say like, it sounds good, but sometimes the best way to make something work is to have something that is perhaps not the most efficient system, but it, it brings more people to the table. 
It's like when you get something done on committee. It's probably faster if you like organize the art museum by yourself, but then you're going to get people or she's going to complain, it's not open on the right days, and he's not going to like what you put in it, and she's going to say she doesn't like the exterior, and she doesn't like the landscaping, and he doesn't like blah, 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 right? And if you had all of those people on your committee, it would have taken you five times as long, but all of their input would have been counted, and in the end you get a more collaborative museum that isn't perhaps maybe the most efficient, but it brings more people to the table. So I would say those are the two main systems. It may be in the future that computer systems come to the point where they are more secure, where people can feel like they can safely do that and entrust democracy with something purely something like that, and that we would all like understand more about it. But I personally don't think we're there yet, so this is kind of like maybe not optimal, but it's the best we have right now that lets people really participate in the democratic process. Does, does that make sense? I mean, I understand what the argument is, but at the same time, I mean, if I want landscaping done, for instance, um, I wouldn't do it by committee, I would hire a landscaper and say, you know, you're the expert, you do this thing. Yeah, but I then mean, you have, like, who's going to, like... Pick the expert. Who's going to pick the expert? Who's going to say that that expert wasn't just like, you know, the guy who's the brother of the guy who runs the plant farm? And is that really the best cypress you want for the area? Do you wish to put the other? Anyway, it's, it's an imperfect system. It's an imperfect solution. But this is what we got right now. Other questions? Yes. I have a question about resources. I get all of these all on the line, and I know it's important to my party and my ideas what happens in North Carolina, but I want to put any money, any donations into Georgia. Ger gerrymandering is Fair Districts. Fair Districts is just a Georgia yeah. organization. Right. Yeah, it's so if you, that, they would be thrilled to give if you gave them money. Oh, absolutely. If everybody here gave them a dollar, they would like call me up and go like, damn. <laughs> Good job. I'm going to get a free t-shirt. No, I want absolutely. to make sure it's used to the best advantage. Yes, so yes. That it's just, there, there are redistricting um, organizations similar to this in many other states. As you saw earlier in, in the PowerPoint, there were some states that have already successfully got stuff on balance. That's because in some states they can have ballot initiatives. We can't put a ballot of initiative on here. That means the citizens can't go, we need the Democracy Act, and we want to get that on there. We do not have that process to get stuff on the ballot in Georgia. To get it to the point where we can vote on it, it has to be a constitutional amendment for this specific thing. And so it has to be this process. And that's what Fair Districts Georgia is really working on. Okay. Yes. I guess I hear you saying that yes, yeah, a, a bipartisan problem. It's a, it's, yes. Uh, well, I, I guess I, I have to go. The cynic in me says, you know what? Why the hell would Republicans go along with this? Because we know that they are, you know, Machiavellian, you know, whatever. I just have a hard time believing that there's a chance of getting these guys on board with something like that. I mean, because they know the current system works for them. I, now, I think at a level, maybe not. You know, I don't know. I mean, right. you're kind of making the argument appeal to their higher angels. I'm no, like, I'm no, sure no, 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 absolutely. I, no, no, I'm absolutely not making that argument <laughs> okay. because I do not think necessarily that any politician has too many higher angels. Okay, <laughs> some of them possibly do, but but they're still politicians, right? And so they're wily. But I think that one thing that all politicians really understand, deeply, deeply understand, is the arc of history swings back and forth. And that the pendulum can be way over here for whatever color you want that to be. But that pendulum has a lot of weight and inertia behind it. And it's going to go back this way sooner or later. And then it's going to go back this way again. And it does this throughout history and it always has. And so definitely not, I, I would say this appeals more to their baser instincts of survival and looking at the long term. And, you know, it, it, they're not going to like it. Like, nobody's really going to like it because now people who had safe seats, and I don't care what color they were, it could be pink or green, right? Those people had safe seats, like up here. Those pink people up in that top district, they didn't have to work for it. They were just like, whatever, I'm running. 
you're going to vote for me because, like, I can tell you are because I drew it that way. <laughs> right? And they don't do any work. So now when we have competitive districts, people have to go and they have to earn your vote. They have to knock on your, your door, your door, your door. They have to answer your very technical questions. And they have to answer your questions about landscape. And they have to ask my questions about whatever I feel like. Right? Those people are accountable to us. So and they don't like it too should much. be, regardless of what party. But they do understand that it does swing both ways. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. <laughs> it's a tough sell in the back, and then I'll come up to you. Yes. So um, I swear I wasn't going to ask any questions, but you know, this political, for lack of a better way of putting it, redlining and gentrification. It seems that the um, Republicans have always been better at it than the Democrats. Yeah. And, um, what's going to make this any different? What this does, I think that some parties are better trying to main a uh, nonpartisan presentation here. So what I'll, I'll keep my answer to nonpartisan answers, but you can read into it <coughs> if you will. So I think that some parties have been better at taking a long view. So some parties are definitely better at playing the long game and at playing the chess, while others, as I'm sure you've heard, it, some play chess, the others play checkers, mm -hmm. right? Which means some are like sitting here going, all right, well, we may sacrifice a couple wins here, but in the long term, we've got all the judgeships or something like that. Mm -hmm. What this does is it effectively levels the playing field. Um, it's possible. It's not easy, which is why I'm here begging you guys to all do what you can to help about it, spread the word, host a party, uh, have a presentation, have fair district people come up and give a presentation, tell your neighbors about it, talk to your representatives about it, but it will reset the playing field. It has been done in other states, it's been voted in, uh, and you know, it, it can happen, and it, it, it is really crucial. That's the best I got. <laughs> Sir? Yeah, um, well more of an observation, really, but uh, the, 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 uh, he, he was um, um, talking about the partisan aspect, and we've seen leaders kind of flip their opinions on, say, it's not exactly the same thing with the Electoral College, and how that um, uh, 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 represents or badly represents the proportion of voters in, in the United States. I think it, it's great because it's going, it's going to make both those in power and out of power equally unhappy, if you can understand that. I, I, I mean, absolutely. I think it's good to make them unhappy. They have yeah. to work for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely fundamentally agree with you, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's a hard sell, right? Because it does yeah. make both sides unhappy. Mm -hmm. But again, they do realize that, you know, if, uh, if enough people make noise about it, you know, and, and we're not talking enough. Falak, like, you're going to talk to this. What is enough? Like, seriously, like, you had 300 people talking about pit bulls. I mean, 300 people is not that much, right? But that was huge. Mm -hmm. So, again, in Georgia, what it takes to influence your legislatures, you saw that slide I showed you about 200 people packed that meeting room, and they're like, whoa, we were just kidding. Mm -hmm. Okay, just 200 people. Okay, I mean, we could, we could do that in the ninth. We could pull together 300 people for some. We could pull together 200 people to go down. That's just the ninth, right? That, oh, well, we have a drive against traffic both ways. <laughs> we could do that. So it doesn't take that much to do it. Um, and, and the people really do need to do this. It, it is critically important, and it will take the people power to do it. But they do respond to people power because they understand that we are who elect them. They just need to be reminded of that. And they probably don't expect anybody to say anything. Absolutely so then when you have so many people, they're like, oh, wow. Well, yeah, absolutely them. they don't. Yes, so our, our absolute best tactic to get this to pass is to call an email and show up in front of everybody in the Georgia House and Senate, um, regardless yeah. of Republican or Democrat, and just let them know that we want this fair districts. Absolutely, to pass. Okay. because because as we've been pointing out, it is you know fairly unpalatable because they have to work sure. regardless if they're in a safe seat in DeKalb or a safe seat in you know Dawson, okay. right? Either one, they're going to have to now like fight for it. Yeah, yeah. And Fair District has a lot more, um, I'm just kind of an unpaid emissary for, for them, but they do, like if you want them to come out and talk to your civic group or your homeowners organization or I don't know, your bridge club or your just best friends or whatever, they can come up and they have some more stuff they can give you, like they have postcards you guys can send out and things like that where you can, um, and they can train you to do what I'm doing because it wasn't that hard. Mm -hmm. I can do it, so. <laughs> more questions? Did you have some? 
All right. Well, thank, thank you, you Judy. Thank you. Yeah.